I'm Christine, and today I'm going to talk to you about REST and its implementation as a web API. So what is an API? Uh, Liz talked about it a little bit. I'll just refresh you again. It's an application programming interface. Uh, the same way humans like to you know, consume data and functionality through an interface that's easy to use and understand, software does like that as well. Um, what I learned uh, researching this was that pretty much everything is an API. So like you know, pressing an F on your keyboard and getting an F to actually show up on your computer screen, that's an, op uh, an API to your operating system, playing music, um, things like that. So everything really is an API, API using libraries. Those are all API calls that we're making. Um, any API with endpoints that are addressable over the web and support HTTP command structure, those are web APIs and really what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, in the category of web APIs, there are two main contenders. There is SOAP, which stands for Simple Object Access Protocol, and then there's RESTful APIs. Um, I'm not going to really talk about SOAP, but you will see it if you decide to research this on your own. Some companies, mostly financial services, uh, tend to use it still. Um, however, REST is becoming kind of like the standard for APIs. So what is REST? REST is, uh, it stands for Representational State Transfer, we know this. Uh, it is an architectural style. Um, another way of saying that, it's just design guidelines um, designed by Roy Fielding in 2000. Um, that being said, it's not a standard, it's not a protocol, it's not an API, it's not a route, it's nothing but a set of standard design principles, um, which I'll get into why that's so important later. Uh, it's independent, so you can use it in a lot of different ways and whatever. Uh, we use HTTP, HTTP with it just because it's easy um, and they pair really well together. But they're not inherently tied, just so you know. Uh, we, uh, Roy Fielding <laughs> describes six constraints of REST. These are them, and I'm just going to talk about them a little bit. Uh, your uniform interface, uh, these are four sub-constraints. Uh, Basically, when a system has identifiers for each resource, manipulates them through sending representations from client to server, and has messages composed of hypermedia, it is said to have a uniform interface. Uh, that thing at the bottom, the H-A-T-E-O-A-S, all it stands for is hypermedia as the engine of application state, and all it is is data from the server that contains information about what the client can do next, usually through links. So not that scary. Uh, client server, we're also familiar with this. Um, they must be able to evolve independently. Uh, this is the idea of decoupling that we kind of talked about as well. Um, not we right now, but we in the program. <laughs> uh, means client really shouldn't know much more than the resource URI, and this allows for scalability. Uh, stateless, we've also talked about. Uh, we're familiar with this. Shouldn't be storing inf any information on the server, really. Uh, cacheable, this is a first class citizen when it comes to REST. Uh, basically, a server res re, uh, the server responses should say whether or not it can be cached or not. Uh, the goal of caching is to never have to generate the same response uh, twice, and it's important because it brings performance improvements for clients and reduces server payload, which is something we're looking to do. Fifth, layered system. This idea is that these components that we integrate into our app. They should do one thing and do it well. Also, your client shouldn't be able to tell if it's talking to like the end server or to an intermediary. Uh, each component should only know what the next layer is. Uh, six, executable code. This is the only optional constraint. Uh, basically what it says, servers can temporarily extend or customize the functionality of a client by the transfer of executable code. This is usually in a script tag in your HTML. So. That being said, uh, when designing an API, you should design it with the presumption that the end user is a developer, not software, or at least a RESTful API. Um, and she or he should be able to read, access, use it easily. Um, so pragmatism wins out sometimes over having truly RESTful APIs. Why is this important? Well, I thought it was important because we've been using these terms a lot. And like I said, REST is just a style guideline. It doesn't really inherently have any standards. So what this means is that people can interpret things differently, and a lot of the time they do. This is a very contested um, thing or idea, even though there is a guy who designed it, and he knows what it does and what it should do, at least. Um, that being said, 
from a user standpoint, it tends to be faster than what I talked about SOAP, at least, because SOAP uh, uses XML and only XML for requests and responses, which um, just is a little bit more heavyweight than uh, RESTful requests and responses. Um, it's simpler than SOAP. I was going to show you some examples, but it's, there really wasn't a good example I'd be able to show you that had like a lot of code that you could actually see because there was a lot of it that was involved. Um, yeah, and then this idea that it can be the compa a company's greatest asset, there are companies that are designed solely around API. So it is this idea that, you know, develop when we're developing, we're using all these APIs. So it's just important to know what you're, to at least have an idea of REST and uh, what good RESTful APIs look like. Uh, these are two quotes I have that kind of stress those points a little bit further. Um, this is from the guy who actually invented REST. So not only him, but other people who use your web services, you know, you're designing them for end users or developers specifically. Um, if your REST has become kind of like a buzzword, so you should just be aware of what you're saying and know what you're trying to do, I guess, if you're saying that. Also, if you program, you're a designer, an API designer. Joshua Block was the chief Java architect at Google for eight years. and. Uh, he has this really good talk on what good API design looks like, and that's just a quote from him. Why I also think it's important. So that being said, I wanted to kind of go through a couple of the conventions um, regarding good API design. Uh, again, it's a style, so it's, you can interpret this any way you want. This isn't, like, there are no hard and fast rules, but these are kind of the conventions in the community. So when you talk about resources, you should really only think about two. You should think about collections and instances. Luckily, we've kind of been exposed to this already. Uh, you can see these are examples that are not good. Um, you should think of nouns, not verbs, and coarse-grained. Uh, get album name, get album artist, uh, get best albums from 2016. As soon as your services start to grow, this list just gets longer and longer and longer. So end users just have to start searching through all these endpoints, and it just makes it a lot more confusing, and it's just not a good idea. This is what you want to do. Albums, albums, and you know your instance would be that album ID. So we're familiar with that. Uh, behavior, HTTP verbs do not have a one-to-one -one, one -one relationship with CRUD. Uh, you know, you should be able to use post only to create. You should be able to use post or put. You should leave that decision up to the person using your API. So there. Uh, documentation, you should, it should be easy to find, not a PDF. You know, you should be able to go to the company's website and be able to see easily understandable documentation, show complete examples of request response cycles maybe, uh, keep the user updated of changes. This is just a bad example because we're all familiar with how that was torture. And um, GitHub, this is a good example. You can see that they have an example request, an example response, and uh, it's pretty easy to digest. Uh, versioning, this is the idea that uh, when you put out an API, it might not be perfect. You're obviously allowed to update it, but when you do, and you're going to update it to a version that may break, you know, code beforehand, you want to just make sure you're trying to, like, at least give your user an idea of what they're going to, what they want to use and make sure that they can at least try and make it easier to implement. So there are two ways to do that. You can put it in your head or you can put it in the URL. There are two schools of thought as for everything. Um, this is an example from Stripe that people tend to like, at least from what I saw on the internet. And uh, yeah, here's are some more conventions. Those aren't the only ones, just some quick ones. Uh, these are all equally as important. Error handling, make sure you're giving descriptive errors. Uh, rate limiting, you know, if you have a lot of data to send back to your client, try and not send back so much of it so you're not sending a ton. You know the obvious downsides to that. Uh, pagination, if you are going to send it back a lot, maybe like 10 per page and at least let them like kind of scroll through it in a easier way. And yeah, that's it. Hope you have a restful afternoon. Mm -hmm.